Hi, I'm Bill Olson. Welcome to Joining Free now, Speech Zone. Is this Richard. is episode 37, and uh, we got some competition there. Anyway, uh, we have several good videos to show you today, and the first one I'm going to show you is uh, Infowars.com, but it's not Alex. This time it's uh, uh, Leanne McAdoo, and she's interviewing Richard Gage of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. So, I guess... If they're ready in there, we'll just go ahead and play that one, and we'll be back in about 10 or 11 minutes. Oh, is Richard Gage, AIA. He is the founder and CEO of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. Thank you so much for joining us in studio. It's great to have you here. You are on an uh, eight-day, eight-city uh, tour of the Great Southwest screening your new film, Firefighters, Architects, Engineers, Expose 9-11 Myths. It's pretty exciting, yeah. Lan. This is uh, an unbelievable piece of work that Eric Lawyer, the founder of Arch uh, Firefighters for 9-11 Truth, and I put together a few years ago, and we finally got this edited. This is new information. We expose 20 different myths that people are uh, imagining in their minds about 9-11, and that the government has put out, and uh, NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, they uh, have completely missed the boat. They have produced a fraudulent report, and Eric Lawyer, uh, former firefighter with Seattle uh, Fire Department, he, he tears them apart one by one. And then I also provide the information that um, just pulls the rug out from underneath the official story, proves the evidence for explosive controlled demolition, in all three of these high-rise that came down on 9-11, of course, including Building 7. Right, which was excluded from the official 9-11 commission report there. Because, you know, it came down in the exact same way, but it probably doesn't mean anything. So, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I feel like that's exciting that there are now experts continuing to come out. A lot of groups, um, obviously, I spoke with Rudy Dent, the 9-11 uh, firefighter. Uh, last year who said that he waited such such a long time to speak out because, of course, a lot of them are afraid of losing their pensions and things like that. I feel like that has sort of passed. Now people mm -hmm. are ready for some truth in this, uh, specifically with the science. Now, you're, you've actually just released a, a new booklet. It's called Beyond Misinformation, What Science Says About the Destruction of the World Trade Center uh, buildings one, two, and seven. Tell me a little bit about what pe this new information, what can people find? Yeah, this is a 50-page booklet where we've condensed all of our best evidence in 50 pages. And we've now distributed this to 40,000 people already in just a month. And it, it's it's wow. uh, going like hotcakes. We, we, we let it go almost at cost, a couple of bucks. Uh, it, is, it is amazing. Uh, what we've done is take on uh, not just the myths, but the fraud of NIST. For instance, uh, they, they uh, try to say that Building 7 came down by normal office fires uh, due to thermal expansion. Well, these office fires were out over an hour before this building came down. Office fires have never brought down a skyscraper ever in the history of uh, much larger, longer lasting and, uh, right. and hotter fires. So we, we take them on one by one in, in this booklet. And it's a very, it's a quality booklet. Now, people should be getting a dozen of these and yeah, handing them out really to their architects and engineers. And beautiful. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is. Uh, we're very proud of it. Um, and it's effective. It'll stay on people's uh, desks instead of like brochures where people might toss mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this is our best effort yet uh, to, to reach academic professionals. We've sent 20,000 of them to architects and engineers. Uh, we expect it to, to go the distance and, and uh, it, it is full of, uh, of, of the best information. For instance, the free fall of Building 7 uh, into its own footprint on the afternoon of 9-11 in under seven seconds. Uh, this, this can't be denied. Uh, and uh, we're, we're blown away by, by the, the, the number of structural engineers, for instance, that say that they've, they've, they didn't even know about this building, right. the third worst structural failure in modern history. Right, and you would think that they would want to know what happened there so they could avoid that mistake or why hasn't anyone come after, you know, tried to sue any of the engineers there with the structural uh, deficiencies there in the building. So there's obviously some, some issues there with that. Um, now, what I'm really interested in, before you started this eight city tour, uh, you were doing some educational outreach at the structural engineering summit. There was like more than a thousand structural engineers in attendance. You had a booth set up there 
uh, for some education on this. What happened? Tell me about that. <laughs> it's pretty exciting because uh, just like you see on the screen, uh, we've got Building 7 uh, going down at uh, free fall acceleration, and we show the structural engineers. Uh, did you know a third tower came down on 9-11 at our booth? And uh, it stops them in their tracks. It's really exciting because they go, no, what, what, what are you talking about? They go, yeah, well, look at it. Tell me, is this building coming down by fire or controlled demolition? And they look at it and they think, well, that's obviously controlled demolition. 90% of them say this. And we go, then we have a conversation because we go, well, hey, this happened on 9-11. This was the third tower to come down. This is the third worst structural failure in modern history. And you and I didn't know about this. Why aren't we being told? Why haven't the structural engineering codes changed? And we ended up signing a, a, a quarter of the people we talked to. <coughs> Excuse me. We, we talk, we, we've got 25 new structural engineers on the site, signed up, calling for a new investigation, joining 2,350 structural, en uh, structural engineers, architects, and many other technical building professionals. Wow, that's, that's pretty exciting. So obviously people are still learning still waking up, still expanding their minds with this. Uh, this situation obviously is not going away, uh, you know, regardless of how, how much they try to bury this. What do you think it is with the cognitive dissonance there? How can people just accept this? Oh, well, they said it's science. And, and you're thinking, well, no, thousands of professionals are saying that's never happened before or since. Yeah. It'll never happen again. Yeah. Well, th we were put into a state of shock on 9-11. And this is true as much for structural engineers as others uh, we found out. Some of them will just say, oh yeah, fire could bring down that building. Uh, free fall, no problem. They'll, they'll actually bypass their neocortex because not one of those 82 columns gave any resistance, which means it could, they could only have been removed, which can only be done explosively, for which there's uh, forensic evidence found by officials for thermite Cutter charges, mm -hmm. uh, it's all it can be. This molten iron produced by thermite, 2,800 degrees required to melt iron. The fires are only a quarter of that temperature in this building. So uh, they go straight to their limbic system, the reptile brain, and, and to whatever they have to comes out of their mouth is reinforcing uh, their worldview. And that's the way we work psychologically sometimes and, and until we kind of something shakes us. Like nine years ago for me, my whole worldview just turned upside down hearing this information from David Ray Griffin. It's cognitive dissonance, and it takes years for some of us to get out of it. Right, and and uh, Matt Drudge was here, and he talked about the sickness of the American people, and t so sick to the point that they would elect Hillary's brain in a jar and sit it on the Oval, there in the Oval <laughs> Office, and let her run the country, just her brain in a jar. And that's how I feel sometimes thinking about this. People are just still being fed spoon-fed all of this BS with this story. And you can look at the, the old videos that are there and the old newscasts that they only aired one time. And it, with the internet, it's not going to go away. All you've got to do is just do a simple internet search and say, Pentagon plane 9-11 and where's the plane? And so there's just this, you know, I just, I don't know what it is with people. So I really am super appreciative of the fact that you have just taken this on as your mission uh, to get this information out there. So this is uh, Austin here. This is, I guess, what, your sixth day of the Southwest tour. Where else you're going? What else is next for you? Pretty exciting. We're, we're jumping straight into, uh, after Austin, we go to Houston and uh, we'll be screening the, the film, uh, Firefighters, Architects, Engineers, uh, Expose 9-11 Myths. And, and that, then we go to Denver. And uh, if we're, we're fortunate, we're gonna fly to Washington, D.C and film uh, a public television talk show with a famous talk show host uh, there in DC on, the, on PBS. Very exciting opportunity for us. And then we start over in New England. Uh, we're, we're, Tony Zamboni, struct, uh, structural engineer, he's actually a mechanical engineer who does mostly structural work. He and I will be teaching a group of a couple of hundred civil engineers at the New Jersey Institute of, New, New Jersey Institute of Technology in Newark. Uh, this is the first time we've actually had civil engineers, many of which are structural, uh, that we'll be showing Building 7 to. We'll wow. be showing how it comes down as fast as a bowling ball uh, off the side of the tower with no resistance from those columns. Uh, we'll be asking them to think, can fire do this? Fire is an organic process, moves through 
the building every 20 minutes or so. And this building is fireproof, fully wow. fireproof. It couldn't even get hot enough <laughs> to sag or fail in any respect. Uh, so th everybody knows once they start looking at the evidence, like these civil engineers are going to do in New Jersey, and uh, hopefully we'll get most of them uh, signed up onto our petition as well. Uh, but then we take this film uh, to 10 cities in New England, uh, Woodstock, New York, uh, Southampton, uh, Port Portsmouth, Maine, well, Hanover. We'll be at Dartsmouth College. That's going to be Dartmouth. so exciting. You're actually having to teach a class to teach people how to think about this reality. Uh, well, Richard Gage, thank you so much for being <laughs> in studio. Exciting. Thanks, Leanne. Find out more AE911truth.org and beyondmisinformation.org. Okay, now uh, I'll show you a little bit of that pamphlet, Beyond Misinformation, a little bit later in the show. Um, but right now, while we're on the 9-11 subject, uh, what about Bush and Cheney? Don't you think they should have been prosecuted for 9-11? I certainly do. I've called for it unstoppingly from the very beginning. Of course, uh, knowingly... Uh, I knew that they wouldn't ever have to face justice, you know. But anyway, so let's take a look at what Jesse Ventura has to say on the subject. He's right on. Bush lied and Iraqis died. Sounds like a war crime to me. If Bush and Cheney ignored intel in order to push forward the Iraq war, they should be put on trial. And I'm not the only one who thinks so. Let's go to my vigilant producer, Alex Logan, in the command center with our story. Alex, take it away. All right, Governor, so at CNN's Reagan Library GOP debate, Donald Trump criticized George W. Bush and his administration for leading to Barack Obama's election, to which brother Jeb fired back. As it relates to my brother, there's one thing I know for sure. He kept us safe. This evoked thunderous applause from the audience. And Jeb's right, right? I mean, well, except for that one time, you know, that minor event uh, in September 2001. Uh, what was the date, Governor? Uh, I think it was uh, September the 11th, 9-11, 2001. I believe I was in office, and I think 3,000 Americans died that day. It was the largest attack on U.S. soil in the history of the country. So we certainly weren't kept safe that day, were we? No, we weren't. And while well, the UN's former chief nuclear inspector agrees with you, Governor, Mohammed El Baradai, a Nobel Peace Prize winning legal scholar, wrote in his 2011 memoir, The Age of Deception, that President Bush repeated in his 2003 State of the Union an unfounded claim about aluminum tubes being used in uranium enrichment equipment despite El Baradei's inspectors concluding they were designed for artillery rockets. El Baradei said, I was aghast at what I was witnessing. He calls the March 2003 invasion in Iraq aggression where there was no imminent threat. He wants the world court to rule on whether the Iraq war was illegal, saying, quote, should not the International Criminal Court investigate whether this constitutes a war crime and determine who is accountable? What do you think, Governor? Is the Bush administration guilty of war crimes? Should there be a trial? Well, they're guilty of war crimes already. We know that for sure because they tortured people and they even did their own investigation on that torture. That's a war crime. Uh, should it be investigated, the Trump up to the Iraqi war? Absolutely. You know, all you hear about is Benghazi, Benghazi, Benghazi. And you hear about Hillary's emails, Hillary's emails, Hillary's emails. Jesse Ventura's been this voice in the wind out there going, really? Well, what about the trumped up Iraq war? What about the lies we were told? Weapons of mass destruction. There were none. Ties to Al Qaeda. There were none. The a rescue of uh, Jessica Lynch, lie. The murder of Pat Tillman, more lies. When do the lies quit? Now those are smaller events, but as far as war crimes go, yes, absolutely. We've already committed them, we tortured. That's against the rules of war. That's crime, and it went all the way to the top. Dick Cheney ordered. He called it his enhanced interrogation. I don't believe he was in a position to make the determination on what is torture and what isn't. And the point is, it is torture. 
Like I said before, you give me Dick Cheney one hour on a waterboard, I'll have him confess to the murders of Sharon Tate. Well, El Baradai cites the prosecution of Serbia's Slobodan Milosevic as precedent, saying, do we as a community of nations have the wisdom and courage to take the corrective measures needed to ensure that such a tragedy will never happen again? What do you think, Governor, would be the result of prosecuting Bush and Cheney? Uh, would the US ever recover as a world power or as a leader of the free world? Uh, sure they would, you know. It, it, it wouldn't affect anything because we do what we want anyway. We have the biggest military in the world, and who's going to tell us we can't? Who out there is going to tell the United States you can't do that? Just as if they did prosecute Bush and Cheney, nothing would happen to them. The only thing that would happen to them, it might restrict their travel. They could be inside the walls that Donald Trump is going to build, and they may not be able to leave. But the point is, it could affect those two individuals if they were tried and prosecuted, because if you're tried and convicted internationally for a war crime, you can be arrested in a lot of places. So, But you'd hear nothing but outrage from the United States. It would never happen, because we have all that power to squash it. So I don't think, I, even though I agree with the guy, I don't think anything will come of it. Well, whether the trial happens or not, there's a strong case against Cheney and Bush now that their key informant has in admitted he lied about everything. Rafid Ahmed Alwan al Janabi, codenamed Curveball, who fled Iraq in 1995 and divulged false information about Saddam Hussein's mobile chemical weapons labs, admitted, quote, maybe I was right, maybe I was not right. They gave me this chance. I had the chance to fabricate something to topple the regime. I and my sons are proud of that, and we are proud that we were the reason to give Iraq the margin of democracy. So it sounds like a personal vendetta became the justification for two wars that cost $4 trillion and had a death toll of somewhere in the range of 300,000 people. But we got Saddam and we got Osama, so it was all worth it, right? Well, again, under false pretenses, here you got this guy Curveball. I read the book all about him. Did you know we never, our intelligence has never even spoken to this guy? He was handled by German intelligence and they don't pass people back and forth. So the only thing we knew was what they told the Germans intelligence and Germany intelligence had already discounted this guy. I read the book. They had discounted this guy as a fraud and they were astounded when Colin Powell got up in front of the UN and was quoting from Curveball on these labs, these that drive around in trucks. We all remember it, they have these mobile labs of warfare and all that. People of the United States need to wake up to the fact that war was trumped up, we were lied to, and we were falsely misled into it. And as much as you want to put your head under the blanket, stick it in the sand, and pretend it ain't so, it is so wake up. So what do you think, vigilant viewers? Is it time that Bush and Cheney had their day in court? Sound off on Facebook or Twitter, and be sure to check Aura.TV to get all the latest episodes of Off the Grid. Until next time, stay vigilant and pay attention. Howdy. Okay, this next one is 25 minutes long. It's part three of a four-parter. I picked the part that I enjoyed the most, actually, but I recommend that you go back and look at all of them. It's David K. Johnson being interviewed by Paul J. on the Real News Network, and uh, they're talking about the deep state, sometimes referred to as national security state, uh, other names, but anyway, the deep state and the power of billionaires. So we'll go to this one and be back in 25 minutes. Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. This is a continuation of our series of interviews on Reality Asserts Itself with David K. Johnston, and who David now joins us again in the studio. Thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. So one more time, quickly, David is a lifelong journalist, a best-selling author. His recent books include The Fine Print, How Big Companies Use Plain English to Rob You Blind, Divided the Perils of Growing Inequality, he was awarded a Pulitzer Prize. He writes regular columns for Al Jazeera America, tax analysts, and he's doing a weekly piece for Newsweek. And so watch the earlier parts, because you just got it, because they're so good. And also, we're just picking up where we left off. 
which was the exposure, uh, David's columns uh, in, the, in the LA Times exposing much of what was going on with uh, Police Chief Gates and how the LA Times closed down that line of, of investigation. Uh, just to finish that story, they, your final act of your piece, they simply wouldn't print. Uh, yes, I was shut down uh, just as I was going to lay out the two officers who'd been undercover for 20 years each, one of whom I had interviewed. Um, a couple of very inconvenient murders. I did get one into the paper. And uh, most importantly, that they had officers undercover. Um, Chief Gates, uh, I was told by one editor, had told uh, someone at the paper that that was evidence that I needed to see a psychiatrist because it was crazy. But when he wrote his autobiography, Chief, uh, there's a line in it that says, I had officers undercover in Moscow in Havana. What, what you uncovered is, is that some people call today more at the national level, but you can see it exists at, a, a, at even city levels. Some people use a term like deep state, which is that there's kind of a, a state power that no one right. really wants to talk about, that doesn't show up in the newspapers, right. but wields tremendous power, and much of it through secret police type agencies and, and such. Um, you saw that up close. Yes. You saw the, its relationship to one of the most powerful, wealthy family that owned the LA Times, which you described in the last segment as essentially most of the family had essentially fascist politics. Yes. Um, so you're getting a picture of the ruling class I, I, I get you wouldn't have had before, I, right. I assume. Um, what does that do to your vision of America? Well, it's, it's very troubling largely because it's not seen by most people and it's not held to any kind of account. And one of the flaws in our notion of that we live in a democracy is that a very narrow group of people select who we get to vote for. Uh, uh, someone like Dennis Kucinich might have a lot of popular appeal, but he will never be a serious candidate for president because those people who have a lot of money in this country are going to use the system to make sure he isn't there. And the media. That's right. Uh, pr president Obama. Look at how closely he's identified with Wall Street. I, I chuckle every time somebody says, you know, he hates white people. Almost everyone in staff is white in the White House, overwhelmingly white. Um, he, he's an enemy of Wall Street. Really? Really? Zero prosecutions of the big bankers for what are well-documented frauds, including by the Federal Crisis Inquiry Commission, whose report Congress paid for and then threw in the round file because they didn't want to look at it. Um, yeah, African Americans may have voted for him, but he's, right. he is the Wall Street candidate. He, he's, he absolutely is. And everybody who gets to run is the Wall Street candidate. And so the, the fundamental problem we have is, look, most people want to live their lives. And if they can have a reasonably decent place to live and a car that will start in the morning and a job with a reliable income and they can have a dog if they want one, they're pretty much happy. Part of that is because our education system is designed to make sure that we produce nice, compliant factory and office workers. You can have a better conversation about politics, sociology, wealth, culture, with the average waiter in rural Ontario or rural Hungary or rural France than with the average MBA in a suit sitting in the first class section of an American airplane. Trust me, I've tested this, all right? And so we, we live in a society where we just put blinders on to these things we don't want to see. I mean, th think for a moment about this use of drones to take out people who I have no doubt are serious enemies of the United States, but which also have taken out wedding parties and children. W just imagine, if, and this I think can happen with the technology, somebody puts a drone up and they want to take out me because I'm seen as a horrible person, and in the process they take out a whole bunch of, of uh, children who happen to be standing nearby, you think that we would react to that by saying, oh, well, you know, that's just casualty of war. Um, so we, we aren't thinking very carefully and deeply about the long run. And, and Paul, the biggest observation that, I, that all this has made me come to is if you look at our policies in America today, whether they're economic policies, political or diplomatic policies, if you believe, as James Watt, Ronald Reagan's treasury, or Interior Secretary said, that we better use up all our resources quickly because Jesus is coming back and he'll be really ticked off. All of our policies make sense. But if you believe human beings are going to be here for way beyond any period of time they've already been here, our policies don't make any sense at all. 
we need to be thinking about the fact that we're just stewards for the time that we're here, and we should be thinking about the great, 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 great grandchildren none of us alive well, that, today that, will ever see. That's certainly not the mentality of the majority, not all, but the majority right. the, of people who own the wealth and, and wield the power in this right. country. Right. It, it's right. like, you know, and how we much also have this ideology that if you're wealthy, somehow that's virtuous. And whatever, a, and whatever shit hits the fan, you will be shielded from it. Because yeah. we're in a big house and we got guards right. and, and, and we'll, you know, our, me and my kids will do okay. Right. But I want to go back to where we were. So, so you see this, you, you get a real insight into you know, who wields power, both at the level of you know, the kind of police state level, right. if you want, and there's, you know, much of what you describe is, is, the, is the beginnings of what be, can become a real police state. Oh, yes. And the wealth behind the media that helps cover this up. And, and there's, a, at the very least, a symbiotic relationship here, and perhaps more in the sense but, that but it, it serves... It's important to see that it's, there's no monolith. It's very fractious, okay? I mean, after all, it's the LA systemic. Times... But the LA Times did run many of my stories before they shut me down. Mm. Um, uh, uh, it's not like they completely covered this up. They ran stories that really, they changed the LAPD's reputation. Um, so within this, this sphere, there are fractious elements, different elements, people who have different and contending interests, people who have no interest in this but care a lot about that. And, but nonetheless, yes, there is a power elite, as C. Wright Mills called it. It operates on its own interests and behalf, and it certainly doesn't like people like journalists. So what do you see going, has been going on now since the beginning of the age of Reagan? Bumper stickers. I don't trust the liberal media. Really, you're going to trust Fox News where I can document to you beyond question they just make things up and they don't correct when they're wrong and they knowingly mislead? I mean, I've made mistakes. Journalists make mistakes. When, when journalists make mistakes, we not only run corrections, but the Jason Blair episode at the New York Times where the sociopath got loose in the newsroom, 90% of what he did was inconsequential stuff, didn't cause any damage, lying but inconsequential, Times ran a 14,000-word Sunday front-page self-expose. When the Philadelphia Inquirer found out its star political reporter was the mistress of the po Democratic political boss of South Philly, they ran, I think it was 32,000 words exposing how they had missed this and not seen it. You ever seen that on Fox News? And yet they tell lies all the time. And so, so you, you, you understand that the, an important element of the wealthiest class in America maintaining its position is making sure that most Americans do not think critically about these things, that we have two income families who are having trouble getting by so that they are devoted entirely to trying to hold their family together and they don't have the ability to be involved in political activities, to then make it hard to vote, to reduce the number of voting machines, to put, challenge people's right to vote, to make these robocalls. If you go to the polls and, and you don't have your ID, you'll be arrested sort of stuff that is nonsense, but people who don't know better are afraid. And it's very, very troubling. And by the way, many of the very, very wealthy people that I know in this country, and I know lots of them, they are as troubled as you and I are about this. They're just not going to assault it frontly. There's two, there's several big lies this narrative is based on. And two of them you've been working on. I mean, you've been working on several, but you've kind of, in terms of where your career is headed, one of those big lies is the tax system is unjust because it takes the earnings of hardworking people and gives it to the poor. Undeserving poor. Undeserving poor, thank you. That's the narrative. That's one thing. And you've been working on exposing right. that it's actually quite a different story, which yes. we will get to. But the other thing you've worked on, and I think it's, it's, it's critical, and, 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 and you did a very, I think, a very important piece for New York Times in 2001, is about the estate tax. And it doesn't get talked about very much anymore. But if you want to talk about the Chandler family who own the, the LA Multi Times. Multi-billionaires. I mean, this whole stratum of billionaires that wields such tremendous political power in the country, because they you know, essentially can buy politicians, you know, that, it's the transmission of that wealth from generation to generation right. that creates what essentially becomes an American aristocracy. Right. So, and the argument there is, well, you're, why shouldn't we? It's our hard-earned wealth, so we're going to give it to us, uh, give it to our uh, children. And then the, the, the thing that always gets dragged out is the farmers. 
Right. If you have an estate tax, right. hard-earned <laughs> farmers can't pass on their farms. So tell us about what you did on well, that. Well, I, I went to the richest counties in Iowa with a photographer from the New York Times, and we said we'd like to find somebody who's lost their farm to the estate tax. And people just laughed. I interviewed 24 local elected officials, all of whom are farmers, all of whom turned out to be Republicans. And they just laughed. That was hilarious. Nobody loses their farm. And one of them said to me, yeah, I don't understand all those New York boys. You one of them? I guess not. Who, you know, b swallow this stuff. It's just ridiculous. There's not a single documented case anywhere in America of anybody losing their farm. And certainly not since 1981 when the law was changed to say that when you die, your spouse can uh, no longer owes estate taxes. It happens when the second and you look, dies. you couldn't find a single farm. I, I interviewed a, a, a professor, Neil Harl, who is a brand name person in the in Midwest farm households. He says, I've been looking for 35 years, I can't find it. Now, to be honest, I, I did find a rancher whose property was lost. He didn't make out a will. He hadn't paid it, filed his income taxes for 10 years. He didn't take advantage of the many, many provisions in the law to protect his business. Well, I'm sorry, we're not responsible for people who are irresponsible. So give us a quick history of the estate tax. Like sure. Start like right after World War II. Well, and, let me go back, and, and what, I want to go back to ancient Athens. Why okay, do we do have it? And then where are we now? The ancient Athenians, and this is what I teach at Syracuse, the ancient Athenians, uh, after the period we call the tyranny, uh, where tyrants seized power, uh, got to this idea that every man is equal. Their notion of man is a little narrower than ours today, but every man was equal. Well, if every man is equal and is entitled to one vote, they said, well, we should pick jobs by lot. Well, let me just add, we yeah. should add every man who's not a slave. and not. Yes, no, no, that's what I mean. Yeah. What I mean is more narrow is that you had to be a man born in, in Athens and women had no political power at all. So they said, well, everybody gets one vote. Well, wait a second, what about the people with all the money who can influence things? And they said, well, no, having more money doesn't make, give you a bigger political voice. That's not one man, one vote. That's not democracy. That's oligarchy. And then they said, well, you know, thinking more about that, the only reason you can acquire wealth is because you live in Athens, because we're civilized. So we have rules about what's your property and what's mine. We have laws to adjudicate disputes and a system to enforce them. We have a military to protect your property. So the wealthier that you manage to become because you don't live in the jungle where thieves will just take your gold, but you live in Athens, the wealthier Athens makes it possible for you to become uh, better off. The greater the burden you should bear, the larger the share of your wealth, you must turn back to Athens so that Athens will endure. This principle of, of the moral basis of progressive taxation is endured for 2,500 years. Even George Bush says that he believes in this principle. Now, World War II comes along. Or, I'm sorry, World War I. Horrible war, right? People dying left and right. There's a draft. And it is argued that the conscription of young men should be matched by the conscription of wealth. Because after all, winning this war will protect that wealth. And so we get an estate tax, which says that on your death, if you have a very large fortune, the government is going to take a share of it. Now, most of those fortunes have never been taxed, even today. I mean, that's what the definition of wealth is, right? Bill Gates starts a company with $50,000 of borrowed money from his parents and turns into the biggest known fortune in America. He hasn't paid taxes on any of the stock that he still owns. And were we to eliminate the estate tax, it would never be taxed. Well, the idea of the state tax is we catch up with you at death and you pay the tax that you deferred until you died. Now we have an exemption of $10 million. And here's where the law is totally porous. Um, I got the Romney campaign to acknowledge in writing in uh, December of 2012, uh, December of 2011, just a year ahead of the campaign, that the $100 million trust fund for the five Romney sons, which have $20 million bucks worth in it, no gift taxes were paid. Now, anybody who has any money at all has heard you can give $14,000 to any, many people as you want, but you've got to pay gift tax above that, and you have a lifetime exemption of, today, $10 million for a married couple. Back then, it was uh, $1.2 million for a married couple. How do you get $100 million tax-free to the kids? Well, this is where the law is, is porous. What they did is they went out and created a company. It had a bunch of shares. It had no business or anything else. It's just a paper company. They give the shares to the kids. Then they start staples. Now you've passed on to the kids all this money. You and I can't do that. 
but somebody like Romney can't. And by the way, the Romney children, the sons, they get their income tax-free right. because mom and dad pay the taxes. And by paying the taxes on behalf of their children, in effect, they pass even more money to their children. So instead of giving you $100 million one year and then you'd have X million after taxes, they give you the $100 million and they pay the taxes. They've really given you the $100 million plus the taxes. This idea that on death, you, if you've done so well because you live in a society that helps create such wealth and you got such a big piece of it, there was still some sense of that after World War II. Yes. You get to where, I mean, chart how we go from, I, I frankly forget the rates, but they were very high after World War II. Under President Eisenhower, a Republican, the highest marginal tax rate was 91%. Yeah, I thought it was an over 90. Yeah. And I, which I think, I think is excessive, but, but, um, but basically... It was but it was accepted. It was accepted. And basically the idea was that once you've got X dollars of income, it's enough. You know, and if you want to spend more than that, the society is going to take a share of that because it's the society that makes this surplus possible for you. It's because we're such a big market. You know, Warren Buffett once uh, said to me, you know, Americans think they're so smart. If you transplanted us all to Bangladesh, we wouldn't be rich. We're rich because we got the rules right. Well, the rules that we're following now are the rules that say, if you already got yours, we're going to protect it. Not, oh, how do we create new fortunes? If you uh, go to Google and watch the whole seven-minute Joe the Plumber Wurlsbacher confrontation with candidate Obama on the streets of Toledo, which, by the way, almost word for word comes out of my book Free Lunch, what President Obama said, he keeps trying to explain to him that you would, under Obama's plan, be able to save more money and have paid a lower tax rate so that you could build up the capital to start your own business. And Wurlsbacher can't hear this. He's, he's completely deaf and blind to this. So let me switch to income tax for a second here. Ronald Reagan got the income tax rate that had been 91% under Eisenhower and then came down to 70% under uh, Kennedy and Johnson. He got it down to 50, and then he got lowered all the way down to 28%. And the news media awful, oh, we've lowered the tax rate. Not for about 90% of the public. Didn't lower my taxes at all. Didn't save me a penny. And oh, by the way, they took away the interest deduction for car loans and credit cards and, and a whole bunch of other rules. And then Reagan got these 11, quote, revenue enhancers, tax increases on ordinary people. And we've shifted the burden in this country enormously. So you t Could, I want to go back, because this is now into the realm of income tax, which I want to get to. But I want to go you back. You want to stick to estate tax. That's I want to stay to estate tax. Okay. What was the estate tax under Eisenhower? Uh, uh, basically, uh, over, a little over half. The, the, um, okay, let me go back. So the estate tax on the, in, back in the Eisenhower days, uh, it came in at a very low level, uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars, be maybe $2 million in today's money. And the government basically took half of everything above that. And yet wealthy people didn't suddenly end up not being wealthy people because it's porous. So just as the Romneys had this device to pass money to their kids, all these wealthy families passed their monies to their kids. And the only ones who didn't pass their fortunes were the ones who blew their fortunes. They either didn't recognize the business they were in was coming to an end because of technology or social changes and invest in something else. But, you know, the DuPonts have been wealthy from the founding of the Republic. They're still fabulously wealthy. And think how many generations and how many DuPonts there are now compared to them. The Rockefellers are still wealthy. The Kennedys are still wealthy. This was never a confiscatory tax. And... You know, there's a very good book written about it in the 50s by a law professor who called it accurately a voluntary tax. It was paid mostly by small business people. They're the ones who got hit with the tax. You know, your local car dealer, your local metal bending factory. Why? Because the big rich, the rich found ways to avoid it. That's right. And the, and, and the devices. It's part of the foundations and, and other things. And the devices that were available cost a lot of money to pull off. I mean, there are all sorts of tax, advice, uh, tax avoidance devices I could tell you about and you and I could do legally. The problem is that the legal fees to do it are run a million dollars. So first you have to have so much money that a million dollar legal fee is insignificant to your wealth. And th this is fundamental to understand that. So you want to have turnover of wealth. Can I just interrupt for just one sec? Uh, when, I, when I looked at some of the actual numbers of, of a state tax that was pre-year 2000, like around 1999, 2000, we were looking at Wisconsin in particular, 
while what, what I, I take your point that it's porous, they actually still did raise a significant amount of money. And then, and then during the Bush administration and then into the Obama administration, even that much was greatly reduced. Right. Well, they, they cut estate tax rates. They increased the amount exempt from tax. And they radically cut enforcement. 85% uh, of gift tax returns, where you make a gift to your children, that were audited were shown to have substantial cheating. People were cheating. They didn't expect to be audited. So they would say, this is worth X. It was really worth maybe 10 times X. So they didn't have to pay the tax on it. So if you don't have rigorous enforcement of the tax laws, I mean, remember, the IRS are the tax police, just like the blue suits are the street police. And we've developed this culture where we go, oh, IRS, they're terrible. You know, the IRS did this or that. No, the IRS just administered the laws Congress passed. And we have radically cut their numbers so that by 1999, you were more likely to be audited by the IRS if you were poor than if you were rich. From the Bush years and then the deal that President Obama finally made with the Republicans during his administration, um, most state estate taxes are gone. There's only a few states, if I understand it, still even have estate taxes. A handful still do. Uh, the federal estate tax was greatly reduced. Um, and, and very little said about it all. Uh, like the media barely paid attention to it. Well, I, I, I would disagree about that. I think there was a lot of coverage of this. Uh, not so much the state level, but the real story at the state level is that pre-George Bush, the federal and state income taxes were integrated. So any money you paid to the federal government, or to the state government, reduced your burden to the federal government. Bush ended that. George Bush's plan actually raised the state taxes on millions of people who have moderate wealth who now fell into their state system and paid more to their state government. Now, you know, Canada, the country where you were born, has what I think is a much more elegant system for this. Uh, if you sell your ExxonMobil stock to buy Apple, you have to pay taxes on the, on, the, on the gain because you made a transfer. Well, in Canada, they got rid of the estate tax, but they now have capital gains of death because when you go, as you will someday, if you have Exxon stock, it's going to go to somebody else. So you had to settle up and pay your estate tax. And I would simply have a rule that says that if you uh, do that, there should be a longevity factor. That is, if you had 50 years you held your Exxon stock, you should probably pay a little higher tax. If you owned it for two years, a lower tax. But you should have to pay the capital gains tax at death. What we do now is we have a system called stepped-up basis. And the simple explanation is wealthy people get to pass the stock on to their kids, and they can sell it and pay no tax. You bought it for a dollar. It's now worth a 1000 Kid sells it for a 1001 No tax due. That's how the wealthy perpetuate their wealth. That is so the what, single so biggest what's, rule. So what's the consequence of this? We've gone from where there, there, was, there was at least some chipping away at some of the right. biggest states. I, I take your point. It right. was porous. It wasn't ever big chipping away. The biggest states remain very big. Right. But even that much chipping away is more or less gone now. Right. So, so what's what does that mean well, to what the it, country? What it, what it means is the reason people don't have jobs, the reason that the median wage is stuck at the same level since 1998, and the average income of the bottom 90% of Americans has fallen back to the level of 1966. I was in, I, look at my gray hair. I was in high school in 1966. And that's where 90% of Americans have fallen back to is this incredible concentration of wealth on very, very few hands at the top. We have created a system that isn't trickle down. The Democrats invented that to denigrate Nixon. It'll trickle down. No, it's Amazon up. Okay. We take from the many to give to the super rich. All right, that's the subject of the next segment of the interview. We did a state tax, now we're going to talk about income tax, and we're going to take on this idea that what's wrong with taxation is we're taking from the working people and giving to undeserving poor. In fact, the story is we're taking from working people and giving to what they think are deserving rich. Please join us for the next segment of our interview, <laughs> David K. Johnston, on The Real News Network. Yeah, the rich have got all kinds of schemes to get you to pay their taxes. Like, one of the, my favorites is video poker here in Oregon. That's right. And so many people don't understand that what they're doing is paying the rich man's taxes. And they don't even say thank you. Well, okay, we're going to go right on to the, this next video. It's an Alex Jones video, and he, he is kind of funny in this one. He kind of goes 
he goes through his whole Alex Jones repertoire. Uh, but the subject is about your devices are spying on you, and that's a fact, Jack. But listen to this, and then I'll see you next week. There are cheating devices in every major smart meter made by more than five companies we've looked at. Every cell phone has microphones, cameras listening and watching to you. All the new smart TVs do. All the new appliances do. It's all fed back to AI computers. We've done tests around the office where we put our cell phones in a room. We're going to videotape this now. We, we've got the patents. We know what's going on. And then we just sit around talking about, I think I'm going to buy a black desk. Yeah, with a leather top. Yeah, black desk, leather top. I want to buy some furniture. I want to buy some furniture. And within an hour, all our phones, Droid or iPhone, start showing us leather desk. Leather top desk. I mean, it, they're listening. <laughs> you understand? Why not? If you're going to commit crimes at this level, why not go to warp, warp, warp? Double warp. There's Forbes. Is your TV spying on you? Yes, it is. We can pull up the patents. They're doing it. They're doing it. So if you want to shut down the free market worldwide of your giant robber baron combines, you bring in corporate control, you buy off the universities, you buy off the courts, you put your politicians in place, then you bring in a global carbon regime taxing all human activity. You put massive taxes on water vapor and carbon dioxide and then you exempt yourselves. Just like the French socialist ruling party, remember it broke three years ago and then no one got in trouble? Almost everyone in the ruling party was caught with giant Swiss bank accounts and pay zero taxes federally. The EU bureaucrats publicly have a law that they don't pay any EU tax, but everyone else does. Just like General Electric expanded power plants the last seven years under Obama. Six and a half years. Expanded coal power plants. Everyone else got shut down. A $3 billion oil refinery built over a decade in Corpus Christi. Not allowed to open. Isn't that cute? But then these other big globalist companies, why they can open up refineries in other parts of the world and ship the gasoline into America. That's how they keep gas prices up, even though they've lowered the price of oil. Gas, as much as oil is a barrel right now, what is it, $45 a barrel or something? Let's check what crude is today. Brent crude. What's Brent crude today? Not sweet, but, but Brent crude. Not light oil, not sweet. Brent crude. $47.50. At that amount, for how long it's been hovering in the 40s, we should be paying about a dollar, maybe a dollar a gallon, and that's with taxes. But notice you're not. And that's because, again, the New World Order doesn't let us have new refineries. And the Associated Press sued, to its credit, back when we still had some free press in this country, in 2001 and got thousands of pages of documents from 96 and 97 where the big 10 oil companies met in the United States and decided to shut down oil refineries and to shut down small refineries and to shut down the new building of refineries and to fund the environmental movement to do it. You know who runs the carbon tax push? You know who gives more money than any other institution? Goldman Sachs. Guess who next gives the most money in a consortium of giving? British Petroleum and Dutch Royal Shell are the second largest funders of carbon tax global warming baloney. And then when I get up and criticize carbon taxes, the brain-dead liberal trendies send me emails saying, I know you're paid off by the oil companies. That's how stupid you are. That's how dumb you are. That's how mindless you are. That's how helpless you are. That's how pathetic and arrogant you are. Is that you are just absolutely turned over to fraud and lies and scams and you love it. You love it. And so, Europe's cheating on its emissions. It's leaked. It's going to come out that every major European manufacturer is doing this. 
I'm not saying they're all going to have the Volkswagen fraud because Audi is a subsidiary of the People's Wagon. But you will have similar cockamamie systems to do this because I've never seen a complex tech device that didn't have Trojan horses laid into it. I remember being told 13 years ago by an engineer, 14 years ago, that it didn't matter if computers weren't hooked to the Internet, that all computers that had been made in the last decade or so, so this is, I guess, 20 years. He was telling me 13, 14 years ago that in the last decade, so that'd be 20 years back or more, they all had transponder chips, capacitor chips in the chips that could be remotely powered by an energy wave that's fired at them so that then the government could download the encrypted data off of it and compress it. So your computer is more high tech than you even know. You're paying for phones and computers and appliances way more than they should cost because of secret global compacts and agreements. What came out four years ago? That Intel and others have secret NSA contracts and are putting the capacitor chips in all the computers. And I've talked to family that's worked at major silicon manufacturers in California and in Austin, and the government comes in, the guys with the bunny suits are kicked out, people come in, they don't even know what the government's putting in them. There it is, snooping, it's not a crime, it's a feature. New apps hijack the microphone to your cell phone to listen to your life. See, it's all fun and happy, but let's go back and, and, and look at the Intel chips. Secret 3G Intel chip gives Snoop's backdoor PC access. And again, the chip is energized remotely, even when your computer's off. They can order it, too, if it needs more power to download your whole computer. It will scan it to see when the computer was last turned on. has an algorithm that you must not be home. They now have more sophisticated algorithms where they get data over power line. They can also take your computer over that way. It's not hooked to the Internet, but it's hooked to a power cord. It then goes in, decides you're not there, fires the computer up, and then gets all the data. <laughs> so loving. I remember telling you over a decade ago, not bragging, just telling you, that DARPA was putting implantable microchips in PTSD soldiers' brains and giving them vaccines that basically ate part of their brain. And now today, it's in the news that DARPA is putting brain chips in people. It was already in the medical journals. All I'm telling you is we don't make this stuff up. There it is, fusion. DARPA is implanting chips in soldiers' brains. According to this new book, oh my gosh, give them a Pulitzer Prize. They went to the DARPA website. I know soldiers that have brain chips. I have family that was implanted eight, nine years ago with under the skin chip. But they sit there and they tell you none of this is going on. None of this is happening. And I don't mean some chip because you've got epilepsy that simply picks up your brain activity when you're about to have a seizure and, and, and controls it. I'm talking about stuff that controls basically everything you're doing and they can kill you when they want to. Here's the financial news. 17.4 million Americans hit by identity theft last year. 66% of victims suffered direct financial loss. Just gets exponentially worse, all by design to make you go to biometrics, which has also been hacked already. They had a hack of 5.6 million FBI fingerprints last week, by design, of course. It's the FBI that's always releasing most of the major Trojans, most of the major worms, most of the major problems. Oh, here's another big story, Washington Post. How the American government is trying to control what you think. And they admit that there's massive propaganda and massive manipulation and CIA psychiatrist teams running around brainwashing everybody. Might have heard that somewhere else a few times, but now it's just out in the open because they're going operational. Remember the Pentagon a year and a half ago goes, because of the Drudge Report and other alternative media, we're going to stop lying. We apologize for stop lying. I'm the Undersecretary of Defense, the Deputy Secretary of Defense. 
and I'm here to tell you everything's fine. We're going to work with you in every community in town, every newspaper, every website. The U.S. Army's here to help with the rest of the joint services. And it showed the military, the generals, the plainclothes people just shaking their heads. Some had tears in their eyes. They had their heads in their hands because they knew what this meant. Full rollout. We're here to help and stop lying. We're here to be domestically with you. We're here to teach you how bad mommy and daddy are and how the carbon taxes are good. And now they just admit it all because, see, they've got to just roll it out and go, well, of course we arrest people that disagree with the government. That's MSNBC. They go, thank goodness. Thank God. Rachel Maddow and others, I've seen them say it. I'll play the clips. Of course we're arresting Tea Party. Of course we're taking your tax exemptions. Of course we're going to put you in jail. You're criminal racist. It's like, of course we're arresting all the Jews and putting them in concentration camps. Of course we're arresting the anti-communist in Russia and putting them in forced labor gulags. Of course Alexander Schultz and each has been locked up. <laughs> we're tyrants. We've taken over. <laughs> I mean, just flaming totalitarian scum parading up and down in front of everyone. And everybody's supposed to just cower and go, okay, I... I was uh, out barbecuing and a couple liberals were out there last night. <sighs> some folks that some of the family knows. And so they came over. They're like, you know, I think this political correctness is getting a little out of hand. <clears throat> I, was, I just didn't even say anything because they didn't really know who I am. I was just like, yeah, it's not supposed it, it's supposed to be like that lady. Yeah, like comedians can't make jokes, and now they're saying just being heterosexual is bad, and I don't know what's going on. I mean, it's gotten extreme, and we've got to accept Sharia law, and I don't know what's going on, and I, you don't know what's going on. You're being conquered. You had your culture taken away. You were trained to roll over. It's like putting a fat, peppy on dog, a little sweet dog, out in the middle of uh, Yellowstone Park in the middle of the night near the wolf packs. So they're going to come out and eat it. You're a little cute little puppy, a little jingly. Oh, hi. Hi, Mr. Wolf. I want to be your friend. Oh, you be my friend? Hi. Hi. Brr. You're like, but I'm cute. I'm sweet. Uh, uh, uh. I complied with everything you said. I rolled over. I showed you my pink belly. And so you'll have everything taken from you. Because you wanted to feel like you were on a winning team. You were part of the Democrats. You were part of the Republicans. You were part of the establishment. You, you, you would watch the news and, in a studious way, regurgitate exactly what you heard to try to sound smart. And, you know, you'd sit there and talk about football with your friends and feel real smart about that. While the whole world was being stolen from you. While cancer viruses were being put in the medicine chain, in your vaccines... While you were being poisoned, the water being poisoned, your food being poisoned, while the diseases exploded, while you were being murdered, while it was all happening, it was all funny to them.